Welcome to this PCR TV session, which is about IFR versus FFR, the combined results of IFR Sweetheart and Defiant Flare. My name is Matthias Gottberg, and I work as an interventional cardiologist at Skåne University Hospital in Lund in Sweden. With me, I have Javier Escanet, who works at Hospital San Carlos, Madrid in Spain, and Justin Davis from Imperial College in London. Welcome. Javier, Congratulations to very good results and presentation here at PCR at Late Breakers today. Uh, could you give us a little bit of an overview on the background of the combined results in the trial? Yeah, thank you, Matthias. Uh, well, you see, this is an, uh, a study that we were very eager to perform because it addresses a very important part of what we call ischemia-driven revascularization. Um, I'm referring to the fact of deferring or not performing interventions once that you have demonstrated that the stenosis is physiologically not significant. We have to remember that the whole cardiological community agrees that performing interventions in situations that are not going to improve uh, the patient, that is not indicated, should not be done, of course, should not be performed, and that actually most of the benefit of the usage of, pre of pressure guide wires, both in terms of patient outcomes but also on um, cost efficiency, saving costs, comes from deferring interventions. So um, it, we felt that it was really important to address this uh, issue and of course we had a great opportunity now that we have two large uh, randomized clinical trials, the IFR Sweetheart, that you are the principal investigator, and the Define Flare study that uh, Justin and myself are the, the co-PIs. So that was basically the focus of um, our research. So Justin, to the audience who's not aware of uh, what IFR is, could you give us a brief background on IFR technology and the trials yes. itself? So IFR is a physiological technique similar to FFR uh, using a pressure guide wire, but the key difference is rather than using a, a drug such as adenosine in a pharmacological based approach, it actually uses a physiological approach uh, by identifying phases in the cardiac cycle where we make the measurements. So this is all done in a fully automated way using algorithms which essentially give the cardiologist uh, a single number from which he can base his decisions, as, as Javier said, whether to treat or to defer the patient. So, and uh, Javier, could you explain the results of the combined uh, studies for us? Uh, sure, absolutely. So, uh, as, as we said, uh, we obviously, the starting point that we had is that we knew from the two studies, they demonstrated separately, is that IFR and FFR were um, very sort of uh, equivalent and um, in terms of outcomes in the long term, they are equally safe. This is something that was demonstrated. And that the first conclusion that we found now putting together these more than 4,500 patients is that without any doubt, you can take a decision based on IFR and obtained the similar outcomes in the patients compared with FFR in the long term for the overall study population. So and that applies not only to the primary endpoint, that was the combined uh, endpoint of MACE, that was the combined endpoint of um, uh, death, uh, myocardial infarction, and, and planned um, coronary revascularization, but also separately to all the different components of this endpoint, uh, death, both cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular, myocardial infarction, and also revascularization. So we were reassured in a way that we have now a new player in the ground uh, that can contribute to uh, outline if the patient requires or not treatment. Now the interesting thing is that we also found that when you use IFR to make your decisions, you perform less interventions than when you perform FFR. And this of course stresses the importance of understanding how those patients in whom you defer or you assign medical treatment uh, do in the long term. And the main result of the study is that today deferring patients based on physiology, meaning allocating them to medical treatment because the stenosis is not significant, is safer than ever. Compared with the only study that we had that was the deferred trial, we are observing less than half of the events that were found in the, in the deferred trial, that basically in a stable patients were an event rate of 8% uh, at one year, and here in a stable patients is below 4%. I, be, I believe it was 3.6% from the population. So these are great news. In a stable patients, we can safely defer uh, our interventions. Uh, any doctors, any of us, 
tomorrow, when we have in front of us somebody with a stable angina who has stenosis um, and IFR or has demonstrated that it's not significant or FFR, we can have the peace of mind of knowing that the evolution of this patient is expected to be very good. Well, yeah, so in my mind, I think the, the combined results are very much in concordance with the IFR sweetheart and the final therapy results separate. Uh, Justin, would you like to comment on the results as well? Yeah, I mean, I agree completely. I mean, you, you've in IFR, a sweetheart and defined flare, uh, on their own, they're by far the busy, biggest physiology studies. Together, they expand the amount of randomized clinical trial data fourfold beyond what we had in a contemporary setting. And what for me is exciting is you are deferring 5% more people, but you have identical uh, event rates uh, between IFR and FFR. So, so it shows us that with these tools, we're being more selective in who we give treatment to, which over the long term may carry out significant uh, advantages to these people. So, so the difference in revascularization rates was something that was noted on the podium when the trials were presented at ACC. And, and what's been demonstrated today is that it doesn't affect outcome. But I, of course, people won't have an explanation for that as well. Do you have any idea on what the difference is between the revascularization rates? Well, we know that uh, to truly benefit outcomes, uh, you need to be really revascularizing lesions, which really need revascularizing. For 20 years or more, there's been constant debate between uh, protagonists for flow and protagonists for pressure as ways of guiding physiological revascularization. We know and found out from many studies over the last four or five years that IFR is more closely related to flow than FFR is. So we know the decision making of these two, two techniques is different and if the IFR is more closely related to flow that may well explain some of the differences that we see in outcomes, namely that you can more selectively identify who to treat and who to defer with the same overall outcomes. Yeah, it seems some data indicate that uh, there's some lesions that are, are labeled as significant with, with FFR, but when you verify them with flow, they're actually labeled as non-significant, and this is why we have the greater correlation between FFR and flow as well. Yes. So, there was an interesting finding among the ACS patients that de were deferred. Could you explain this to us? Yes, of course, I mean, one of the say other aspects that we're very interested in investigating was the safety of deferring, not performing interventions in patients with acute coronary syndromes. The reason for that is because actually we did not have solid evidence. The deferred trial that, as we said before, it was performed nearly 20 years ago, was focusing on patients with a stable angina. Nowadays, acute coronary syndrome is one of the most important indications for having our patients in the cath lab and to make decisions in those patients. So it was very important to really gain some uh, observations on this, particularly since uh, a couple of investigators, a couple of groups came with concordant findings that in patients in whom PCI was deferred on the grounds of FFR in acute coronary syndromes had an excess of events in the long term compared with patients with a stable angina. So there was this concern that perhaps the physiological environment that you have in acute coronary syndromes influences the measurements that you are making with FFR, and that therefore you may have a suboptimal decision making in this situation. Now, the findings are very revealing and they truly support the uh, findings of these investigators they have mentioned. We also observed that in the, deserved, in the deferred population, those who presented with an acute coronary syndrome have about 6.5, if I don't remember well, percent of event rates in the long term, while in the stable coronary cord, it was less than 4%. And this was a statistically significant, interestingly, for FFR. So for whatever reason, FFR was more influenced by this clinical presentation in terms of different outcomes in stable and unstable patients than IFR. Now, how to integrate this from a physiological perspective? Well, this is of course a hypothesis generating and I'm sure that now we will have to investigate a lot into this particular area, but if we remember that one of the consequences of acute coronary syndromes is that um, it blunts the hyperemic responses in not only in the culprit territory, 
but also in the territory of the non-culprit uh, artery, it may well happen that in some cases uh, the use of a hyperemic index like um, FFR may not be the best solution and that may perhaps trust more the use of resting indexes. And this is something that of course has to be explored because um, the, the study was providing valuable uh, hints the, on this particular aspect. For the time being, there is no doubt that still the rate of events that we find in the ACS cohort is lower than the historical uh, rate of events in the deferred population of the deferred trial. It's about 6.5%. So that means that um, the magnitude of the problem is not huge, but obviously opens a lot of possibilities for further investigation uh, in the area of uh, physiological assessment in patients with acute coronary syndromes. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I think that there's been somewhat of a discordance when looking at the deferred rate in SAS patients in smaller clinical trials. So this really adds up the body of evidence of use in physiology in ACS. And, and to be honest, the most the majority of my patients in, in Scandinavian practice is ACS patients. So we see that we use them as much in ACS patients as we do in stable angina patients. So I, I think that we complete, uh, we have enlarged the body of evidence significantly with the combination of those two uh, trials. So can you give us a little bit of insight on the clinical implications of these findings? I mean, let's not forget, the, the, these studies are huge. Uh, so the ACS deferred patients in this study are as, as big as the physiology randomized patients in the Hall of Fame. So we, we've got a lot of information. And have it right, you know, we must all obviously be uh, self-critical when we're analyzing studies very carefully. But I think some of the messages here are very clear. We know that many of our colleagues are correct to be sometimes worried that they're getting maximal hyperemia when they're making FFR measurements. And they're worried because they've seen data which show that under conditions of acute coronary syndrome, you could have a blunted response to adenosine, for instance. Now, why these results to me are very exciting is that you, show, you see for the first time two things. When you see that there's a difference between uh, the FFR and IFR uh, way how it handles deferred lesions. So you see that there is actually uh, an inferiority there with regards to the FFR uh, measurement of acute coronary syndrome places who are deferred, about a 3% uh, difference between that with the stable patients. But interestingly, and perhaps revealed for the first time here, you see using IFR as a resting index, we don't see this same difference. So colleagues are right to be uh, concerned that perhaps they're missing lesions. We see in this study that perhaps if you miss those lesions, it leads to an increased MACE rate with FFR. But what's really exciting is now we potentially have an alternative, which is less reliant on hyperemia, or not reliant on hyperemia at all, which means we can safely make these deferral decisions under acute coronary syndrome conditions. So if we would round this up, Justin, uh, could you give the audience just a few sentences on the main findings? and your interpretation of this combined results of the IFR sweet art. And sure, I, think, I mean, trials. the confined results uh, presented here today really reaffirm the individual study findings that were reported at ACC and in the New England Journal of Medicine. We know that overall, if you use IFR or FFR to guide revascularization decision making, they're both very good and very safe techniques. And the results show that you can't distinguish whether one on those grounds is better than another. What we saw uh, today was there were differences on deferring between ACS patients with FFR and IFR, which were in favor of IFR. And we, we certainly saw from the previous data presented at uh, the ACC that both of these uh, studies are much um, better tolerated by patients and actually uh, have fewer signs, so fewer uh, symptoms of rhythm changes and hi uh, hypotension reported by physicians as well. And in the FLARE study, we also sh saw that there was a shorter time uh, interval for actually making these measurements. So overall, you could say that uh, there are significant advantages for both the, the physician, uh, the patient, and very likely when we have the full cost-effective analysis, also the payer as well. Javier Escaned, Justin Davis, thank you very much for coming here. And this concludes the session on IFR versus FFR, the combined results of defined flare and FR sweetheart trial. Thank you very much. <laughs>